Yeah, you can clap. It's great. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Dave Ross. Let's stand together as we close out this month and this holiday season and this year. Let's sing together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings Let's sing it out! Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and every our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take 
on me. All right, let's get our hands going together. Sing, go tell it. Go tell it. continue to sing together. We're going to continue to sing about that Jesus Christ was born, and we're going to sing with joy, joy to the world. Let's sing together. Welcome to Calvary Church. You may have a seat. My name is Scott Messner. I'm part of the Global Ministries team here at Calvary Church, and I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas uh, over this last week. For those who were with us attending last weekend with one of our four services, uh, thank you so much for attending. For those who served, thank you so much for being a part uh, of investing in life change through uh, our Christmas Eve services last week, and it was a wonderful opportunity for us as a church to serve together and invest in life change there. And as we turn the calendar over this evening, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, I hope everyone has a, a wonderful and safe uh, New Year as they celebrate with friends and family this evening. Now, for some of you, this may be your very first time at Calvary Church, and if that's you, we're so grateful that you're here with us this morning. And maybe others, you came and joined with us last weekend, and you, you came back, and we're so grateful that you've joined with us this morning, and we would even encourage you as we go into the new year that you would continue to consider and to be a part of, of the direction that we're going together as we head into 2018. If you want to know more about Calvary Church, one of the ways that we do that, I'd love to invite you to what we call the Welcome Gathering. The Welcome Gathering takes place immediately following this service, and it's an opportunity to do a couple of things. The first thing is to answer any questions that you might have, uh, to help you get acquainted with some of us as a staff, but also to get acquainted with Calvary Church. How do you begin to invest? What does it look like uh, to, to be a part of, of Calvary Church moving forward? And so immediately following this service, you've got any of the doors in the back, turn to your right, look for the signs that say Welcome Gathering. We'd love just a couple of minutes of your time to be able to greet you and to get acquainted with you. Now, for those who are new, typically at Calvary Church, we serve lunch each and every week. Uh, but today, there will be no lunch. And so the message 
for you is that if you want pork and sauerkraut, you're on your own. <laughs> However, next week, we'll be back to our normal, normally scheduled lunch, and we would love to have you. It's our way of continuing the conversation that starts here in the auditorium, continuing the opportunity to fellowship and to get to know one another uh, over lunch. So next week, lunch will be back as it typically is is. Now, we, before we pray this morning and before, we, uh, before I pray and before we receive the offering, I want to do a little year-end housekeeping. As most of you are aware, uh, our government allows us as citizens to have a tax benefit by giving to nonprofits and to local churches, uh, but the government requires us as a church to account for those gifts received uh, in the year that they were given. So, for any year-end gifts that you may be intending to give, and wanting them to be receded in 2017, those gifts need to be receded, received today. Uh, the government does not allow us uh, to receive any contribution after today and receipt those gifts for 2017, even if they're post-dated. So, if this really wasn't on your radar because of the holidays and it's New Year's Eve, but you had an intention to give a year-end gift, but you're not prepared to do so now, the main office door near the chapel over on this side uh, will be open until midnight tonight. <laughs> Once you go inside that door, there'll be a secure way to drop off your contribution inside those doors. And I know you laugh, but our goal is to really to accommodate uh, for those and any of anyone who really wanted to give that year-end gift, but it just got off your radar altogether uh, to serve well and to be able to accommodate those who have that on their mind and on their heart. The other way to do it is online. Uh, if you log into our website and you uh, click on the Give uh, Now link, there's a way to register and to be able to give that year-end gift uh, in 2017. Above all else, though, really, thank you so much for continuing to invest in the ministry of Calvary Church as we seek to help everyone, uh, both here and around the world, pursue life in Christ. Thank you for not only your contributions uh, through finances, but your contributions in service and your heart and your passion for this ministry. We, are, we really believe that God is using us in, in incredible ways to change lives uh, here and around the world. So thank you so much for playing the part that you do each and every week. And in addition to generosity, we want to be people who are, are really marked by prayer. And so would you join me uh, as I pray for us this morning? Father, as we look to a new year, we thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the things that you have allowed into our lives this year and what you have been able to accomplish in and through this body. We thank you for the many lives changed and for the many who have come to know you personally because of the ministry of Calvary Church. Father, we think of the many difficult circumstances that have even taken place within this body over this past year. Would you continue, continue to bring light to darkness? Would you continue to use every circumstance for your glory and for our good, even when it's hard? We pray for your spirit to lead us each step of this new year. We ask that you will guide our decisions and turn our hearts to deeply desire you above all else. We ask for help to pursue you first, above every dream and every desire that you've put within our hearts. We ask for your wisdom, for your strength and power to be constantly present within us. We pray that you would make us strong and courageous for the road ahead. Father, give us an ability beyond what we feel able to let your gifts flow freely through us so that you would be honored by our lives and others would be drawn to you. We ask that you would keep our footsteps firm on solid ground, helping us to be consistent and faithful. Would you root us in your truth? Would we supernaturally be able to be people who not only know your word, but live it out in spirit and in truth? We confess our need for you. We ask that you make all things new in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives for this coming year. Help us to be known as people of generosity. Help us to look to the needs of others, not to be consumed by only our own needs, but to love those around us well as you have loved us. May we be lovers of truth, May the fruits of your Spirit be evident in our lives. Shine your light in us, through us, over us. May we make a difference in this world for your glory and purposes. Set your way before us. May all your plans succeed. Help us reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. Lord, would you reign in our lives. We know all of creation groans, and we groan with it as we see and experience the effects of sin in our world and in our lives. 
But for today and for this year, God, would it be the cry of our hearts that you would reign in our lives, that we would surrender every area over to you. Lord, as we take this offering now, would you use it to further your reign in our community and the world around us? Would it contribute to making a difference, not just in this life, but for all of eternity? To you, God, be the glory and honor in this, in this new year and forever. Amen. At this time, I'll ask the ushers to come forward to receive our morning offering. beginning of this month as we began celebrating the birth of our Savior on December 3rd, I read a passage from the book of Isaiah that talked about the coming Messiah. And I'm going to read that again as we end our month here. It says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. 
The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. Truth is, the moment he was born, people started praising Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. But he's been being praised since the beginning of time, and he will continue to be praised till the end of time because his rule will be forever and ever. And so we continue to read in the scriptures that he was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. It's fitting that we join together and continue to sing our God who is on his throne this morning.
be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord, of all. And unto you, the slain and risen King, we lift our voice to heaven, singing worthy, Lord. our Savior and our Messiah, we lift you up this morning. We give you all the glory, and we honor you with our voices, our hearts, and our minds. Continue to lead us in this new year by your Spirit, to surrender to your will, and follow you day by day. We thank you for your love and your grace, and we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You can have a seat. No matter how secular Christmas is becoming, it will always be about Jesus. But have we paused long enough to understand why? Why a baby? Why Bethlehem? Why a virgin birth? A stable? A star? Why set up the nativity? Why sing about him and to him? Why give gifts in his name? Why is he the answer to life's biggest questions? This Christmas, perhaps more than ever, we need an answer to the question, why Jesus? Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bo Eckert. I'm the senior pastor here at Calvary Church, and I want to offer my welcome and greeting and Happy New Year to those of us here in the room, to those of us joining us by radio on this very cold New Year's Eve, and those joining us and tuning in over the website as this service is being streamed. Um, Thanks for being with us. We're we're grateful for that, grateful that you've decided to end your 2017 year with us here this morning. And before I get into this morning's message, uh, just a few items of kind of personal housekeeping Uh, for us as the family here at Calvary Church. First of all, I want to thank so many of you um, for your outpouring of cards and gifts uh, to me personally, to the staff here at Calvary Church. Um, Kind of throughout the month of December, there's many of you that came by and dropped off uh, cookies and treats and things like that for us here as a staff. And you know, we put on a few extra pounds during December, but we feel like because you go to, to that extent, we have to honor you by eating that. So uh, we just want you to know that we do take care of those in the staff kitchen here at the church. So, so thank you for that. And for the cards and for the letters and the updates on your family, we can't get back to each of you personally, but they are read and they are uh, very much appreciated. So thank you so much uh, for, for doing that during uh, this Christmas season. And thanks also, as Scott said, for so many of you that faithfully give to Calvary Church and that you serve here at Calvary Church. And we need to keep thanking you for that, and we need to keep reminding you of that because it can be easy, if we're not reminded of that, that we can kind of drift into this mode that church is something that we come to, church is something that we watch, and we kind of passively sit back while others up front kind of do their thing and as we understand what a local church is biblically, we are the body of Christ. And so many of you love Calvary Church, not just because of what happens here in this room on a Sunday morning, but just because of all that goes into it and the way that so many of you serve and use your gifts to, to, to honor God and to serve other people. And that's what makes Calvary Church great, and that's why you love Calvary Church. So thank you for Uh, participating, for giving, for serving, uh, for making Calvary Church uh, what it is. It was a great, great year here in 2017, uh, and we look for wonderful things that God will do uh, as we turn the page into 2018. And thanks for last weekend. So many came, so many served. 
Uh, we had a wonderful four Christmas services together. Nearly 6,000 people were here to participate, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, time of, of four services, and we had a kind of a little bit of everything during that service. If you missed it, you can go to our YouTube channel and, and check it out. We ended with candles, and there's wax on the pews to prove that in case you want to uh, question that, but, uh, but it was a great, great time together, so thank you uh, for that as well. Today, I'm going to finish up our Why Jesus series that we've been looking at all month long. And next week on January 7th, we are jumping back into the one story of the Bible, from beginning to never ending. For those of you that haven't been here uh, before Christmas, we, uh, are, we began a series about the one story of the Bible uh, and how it all holds together and uh, kind of life from God's perspective. And we're breaking this series down into different seasons and episodes. And uh, so we did season one before Christmas and next week we will begin with season two. So I hope you come back and join us for that. And the other thing we want to make you aware of that's going to take place next Sunday morning, and we've been doing this now for a few years, um, we as a family go through ups and downs together, and one of the things that we do is we mourn with those that have lost loved ones. And uh, it used to be that our annual meeting, we would read the names of those that passed away in that previous year, and now we do that together on a Sunday morning. So next Sunday morning, the first Sunday of the new year, we will reflect back on 2017 and remember and give thanks to God uh, for those that have, have passed away in 2017. So, uh, so that will happen next Sunday morning. We want you all to be aware that that is taking place. But today, as we finish up this series entitled Why Jesus, we've been looking at this question all month long, and we've had, there's lots of different answers to the question of why Jesus, and you say, why are we looking at that question? And the reason we're looking at that question is because we make a big deal about Jesus. We make a big deal about who he is and what he did, and it's easy if we're not careful to just kind of go through the motions of church, and we want to keep pointing people to Jesus and help to understand who he is and, and what he's all about. And we've been talking about that from the platform here this month, but we've encouraged each of you to engage with that. And we don't want to just kind of end that as the, the, the month of December ends, but we've encouraged and I've challenged you for, for some of you, you need to take a first look at who he is if you're new to church church and new to, uh, to, to what, you know, God might be doing in your life. Some of you, you need to take a fresh look. You've kind of gotten away from it. And others, you need to dig in and take a closer look. And we've encouraged and challenged you to do that by taking the Bible for yourself and opening up God's Word and opening up to one of the Gospels, one of the four accounts of the life of Jesus that's found in the, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each written by a, a different author with a different purpose. Um, but all describe and tell us about who Jesus is, what he did, what it means. And as we answer that question, why Jesus, we want you to dig into that for yourself. So maybe you weren't able to engage with that during this month of December, but you say, hey, turn in the page tomorrow to 2018. I want to get into God's word. I want to read it as an individual. I want to read it uh, as a couple or as a family or as a small group or whatever it might be. So open up one of those Gospels and start to dig in and see the answer to that question for yourself. But today we're going to take a final look at this question. And as I just said, we have to do this because if we don't, the temptation will be there to just go through the motions of doing church. But everything that we do this room, around the building, in people's homes, and everything that we're doing is, do is pointing people to Jesus. It's why our vision statement says that we are pursuing life in Christ. People are pursuing life in lots of different things these days. They're trying to find life in relationships, in their career, in money, in all different things. We want to help people to know what it looks like to pursue life in Christ. So we have to answer that question, why Jesus? And one of the reasons that we need to answer that question, and, and track with me here just for a moment in this introduction, we have to track with that question because sometimes if we're not careful, we can think that Jesus is just an enhancement to our life. That Jesus is just kind of an add-on. 
That we're going through life, that we're doing our thing, and then we add a little bit of Jesus to try to make life a little bit better. That's a wrong way to think. Jesus is not an add-on or an enhancement to life. Jesus is life. So to dig into that a little bit more, when I thought about that concept of enhancements to life and and add-ons, I don't know if you shop on Amazon, but Amazon has what they call add-on products that you can't necessarily buy individually, but you can add them on to another order. So I went on to Amazon and I I just kind of looked and typed in there the the word add-on just to see what the type of add-on items that there are, and and I made a list, and here's the add-ons that came up. Cough drops, mascara, Sharpie markers, toothpaste, a mini flashlight, disposable razors, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. Now, if you don't know what Mr. Clean Magic Eraser is, it'll change your life. Especially if you have little ones running around, it cleans up anything. Those things are great. Elmer's glue. And the last, at the bottom of the page, I didn't go to page two and page three, but the bottom of page one, there are tweezers, but not even as a sub thing. As the main description of these tweezers, they are specifically designed for ingrown hairs. So if that's something that you struggle with going into 2018, Amazon has an add-on for that. And now let me just be clear. Um, I get no kickback from Amazon or Mr. Clean or Sharpie. I'm just, you know, seeing what's there. And, and you say, well, why, why is that important? Most of those items, if you think about it, they are first world items. People in third world countries, are just trying to figure out where their next meal is coming from, let alone an add-on that will enhance their life. So as people that live in the first world, We have to be careful that we don't do that with Jesus. That we can't just go through our lives and through all that we're doing, and then we add in a little Jesus just to kind of enhance our life. Jesus is life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So I'm going to do my best as we continue on into 2018 as a church, to not let us just go through the motions and not let us to just treat Jesus like an add-on. But we need to continue to dig in and effectively answer the question, why Jesus? So today, Jesus is going to answer that question for us. We're going to look at a time and a, a period in his life where he is essentially going to, in his own words, answer the question, why Jesus? And it's at a time of his life where he is preparing his closest followers for what life is going to be like when he ascends, when he dies and and comes back to life and then ascends back to his father. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to John chapter 13. It's found on page 900 in the Pew Bible in front of you, or you can take an electronic device and uh, open up a Bible app or go online and make your way to John chapter 13. We use the ESV, the English Standard Version, as we look at this passage together. As I mentioned, this is Jesus pulling together his closest followers in an upper room to prepare them of how to live life once he's gone. And it's actually a really good passage for us to look at at this time in our lives. We're at the end of 2017. We're turning the calendar page to a new year. What does it look like for us to live life in light of the first coming of Jesus that we just celebrated all month long and looking ahead and anticipating his second coming? This is what some commentators call the upper room discourse or the farewell discourse. And Jesus has gotten those followers together. He says his hour has come. He knows that he's in Jerusalem to die, to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And he, in that moment, as they're sharing a meal together, he 
gets a towel and a basin and he washes the feet of his disciples. He dismisses Judas who is about to go and to betray him. And when Judas leaves the room, the final farewell from Jesus really begins. When Judas leaves, the mood in the room has changed. And here's what John tells us took place. John chapter 13, starting in verse 31. When he had gone out, well, who's the he that has just left? That's Judas. Judas is going to betray Jesus. When Judas left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And for those that aren't familiar with that term, Son of Man, who is he talking about? Is he talking about somebody that's there in the room with them? Is he talking about somebody else around Jerusalem? Jesus is referring to himself. It was the favorite way for Jesus to talk about and to refer to himself. Used in every gospel multiple times. Over and over again when Jesus talked about himself. He referred to himself as the son of man. And by referring to himself as the son of man. He is essentially answering the question for us. Why Jesus? And the answer to that question is because he's the son of man. And you should naturally say, but what does that mean? That's a, not a common phrase and common term that I understand. I think there's a twofold, maybe even more than that, meaning when Jesus uses that. One, I think it is fulfilling the prophecy that we see in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel's prophecy... Here's just part of it up on the screen for you. says this. Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. They understood that as this is the coming Messiah. The rescuer. The deliverer. Who would come to make things right. To make things right between God and man. So when Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, I think he was referring to himself and saying, I am the fulfillment of that prophecy. I am the Messiah. But wrapped up in that phrase is also just the fact that son of man is referring to a human being. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, was referred to as the son of man nearly 90 times. So I think Jesus is saying in that phrase, fully human is the son of man but I'm the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7, and I am the Messiah that's going to come. And when he used that phrase, not all the time in the Gospels, but many times when Jesus used that phrase, he was actually referring to his second coming. You see, Jesus came and we celebrate his first coming, born, placed in a manger. We've been doing that all month long. But when Jesus predicted and talked about his second coming, the imminent return of Christ. Nothing else needs to take place in God's salvific plan before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there's lots of teaching in Scripture on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus talked about it, he often used that phrase, son of man. Here's just a couple quick examples. In Matthew chapter 24, therefore you also must be ready. Why? For the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You see, some want to dig through Scripture and try to figure out the details of his second coming and what's going to be happening in the world and when's it going to take place and all of this. All we're told is that Jesus is going to return and we must be ready for his return. It could happen at any moment. It could happen today. It could happen in 2018. Are we ready for the return of Christ? And are we living lives that show that we're followers of Christ anticipating looking forward to his return? Mark chapter 13, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Again, that phrase connected to his return. Luke chapter 18, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? 
Will he find people that are ready and anticipating and looking forward to his return? So in this context of preparing his disciples for how to live life in light of the imminent return of Jesus, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. What's he talking about? How is he going to be glorified? How is God going to be glorified in him? Well, he started this by saying that his hour had come. You see, the, the shadow of the cross was over Jesus' entire ministry. And he knows that all he was doing was leading towards him dying on the cross to pay the price for the sins of the world. So when he talks about in this hour the Son of Man being glorified and God being glorified as a result, he's referring to and referencing his death and then subsequent resurrection. Why would he receive glory? Why would God receive glory from that? Because God was going to do in Jesus what no one else could do. He was sending Jesus and had sent Jesus to do what nobody else can do. There's something in us, I believe, as human beings that we want to try to figure things out on our own. And we want to try to do things for ourselves. And I know that this is somewhat stereotypical, so forgive me. But typically, men, this is how we think. We want to be able to do things on our own. We want to be able to provide. We want to be able to fix. We want to be able to take care of things. I experienced this when Erica and I got married our first year of marriage. She might correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the first thing that broke when we were newly married was the toaster oven. And I said, maybe she said, well, why don't we just buy a new one? Or why don't we call somebody that knows what they're doing to fix it? And my response was, I got this. I can fix this. I can take care of this. I wanted her to know that I could provide for her and for us. So, took the toaster oven apart. Completely. And by a miracle that only could have been God's grace, I got it back together, and it actually worked. Thank you. Praise the Lord. However... There were some parts left over. <laughs> and Erica graciously came and said, what are those parts for? And my response was, they're kind of like an appendix. <laughs> Nobody's really sure what it does or why it's there. It's just kind of extra. They just kind of put in those extra pieces and those extra parts. Some of you, you know what that's like. Ladies, you know what that's like because you've lived with that for many, many, many years. And your response is often, just call somebody. Just call somebody who knows what they're doing. It will save you time. It will save me headache. It will probably end up saving us money. No, I can do it. I got this covered. And I know that's a little stereotypical, so I'd love to hear back from you all. Is there stories where those roles are reversed? Is there any households where the lady, where the wife is saying, I got this. I can do this on my own. And the husband just kind of shakes his head and said, this isn't going to end well. I don't know. Love to hear those stories. What's the point? The point is there's something in us that says, I can fix this. I can do this on my own. And I think that mentality carries over into our spiritual lives. And I think it carries over into our relationship with God. 
There's something in us that we know and we recognize that something is wrong and broken in our relationship with God. But our response is, I can fix this. I can be a good enough person. I can do enough good deeds. I can go to church enough. I can give enough. I can serve enough that it's going to fix this problem. And God sent Jesus because we can't fix it on our own. There's nothing that we have that can contribute to the repair work that is needed with what separates us from God. We want to help. We want to stand there and we want to hand the wrench or give the screwdriver or, you know, no. God says, I'm sending Jesus as the rescuer, as the deliverer. I don't mean this in a trite way, so understand it. Sending him as the repairman to do what we can't do on our own. And because that is the case, Jesus is glorified, and as a result, God is glorified because Jesus is doing what no one else can do. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. When that happens, when Jesus comes, it brings him and it brings God great, great glory. So Jesus goes on and continues his teaching and he says this. He says, little children. Some of you, you need to hear that this morning. Some of you, your view of God is that he's angry and that he's out to get you. And God is a judge. But God provided for what separates him from you. He wants to reach out and he wants to call us little children. And he looks at these guys around the table and he wants to take their discouragement and he wants to bring encouragement. He wants to take their natural way of thinking and transform it to a supernatural way of thinking. His love and his intimacy continues to be on display. He is preparing them for how they are going to live once he is gone. He says, in a little while, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. There might be layers of meaning in that statement, but I think one of the things that's there in that statement is, I'm about to go and do what you can't do. I'm about to go and fix something that my death on the cross is going to fix that you aren't able to do. And when he says that, he tells them what he's going to do. And now he says, and here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to live. In light of my first coming and in light of my second coming, here's what I want you to do. Verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. And we might look at that if we know our scriptures and we might say, I think I've heard that before. Is that really a new commandment? How is it new? I think the answer to that is in what he says next. He says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. He has shown them how to do it. And he says, this is how I want you to now love going forward. You see, when we often think about love and when they thought about love, it was probably a reciprocal love, a contractual love. You know what that love looks like? I will love them as long as they're doing this for me. I'll scratch their back just as long as they're scratching mine. It's contractual. You do this, I'll do that. That's not the type of love that Jesus is calling them to. He's calling them to a self-sacrificial love. And he's saying to them, and I think he would say to us, you have to get this right. 
you have to get this concept of loving one another correct. And here's why. Because it's not just about your holy huddle when you get together. He said, I'm preparing you to go out into a world with a message that can revolutionize people's lives. And here's what they need to know. He says in verse 35, By this, by the way you love one another, by the way you love other people, all people, not just Christ followers, not just the people at Calvary Church, but all people will know that you are my disciples. They will be known as followers of Jesus for what they believe, for what they teach. Yeah, that's part of it. But mainly because of how they love and how they care for one another. So I have to ask myself and I have to ask all of you as we turn the page into 2018. What are you known for? He says, all people will know this about you. They will know that you're a follower of mine if you have love for one another. You're known for the family that you're in. You're known for the job that you have. You're known for the fan of a sports team that you root for. You're known for the, where you live. There's lots of things that we're known for. Are we known as followers of Jesus Christ because of how we love one another? I don't know if you guys take me up on this. Sometimes I challenge you to go and have some hard conversations with the people that you love, sit around the lunch table, sit around tomorrow watching bowl games, whatever it might be. Are you willing to bring up that topic to the people that know you the best and say, hey, what am I known for? What am I known for in our family? How am I perceived in our family? Attention to detail? Disciplinarian? Fun and games? How am I known around the workplace? How am I known in the community? There's lots of things, lots of answers that you might get. Are we known to be a follower of Jesus Christ because of the way we love other people. We have to get this right. Let me press in a little bit more and help us to think about this so that we can really kind of meditate on it as we go into 2018. Do your beliefs drive you towards people or do they pull you away from them? Does what you believe drive you to people or does it put up walls and pull you away from them? Because Jesus knew who he was, knew where he was from, knew where he was going, had a true self-assessment of who he is, I believe it pushed him towards people. He was known as the friend of sinners and the religious people hated that about him. He was drawn to people that were different than he was. How about you? Do your beliefs and your convictions put walls up between you and others? Or does it actually draw you towards people? You say, what does that mean? How can my beliefs separate me from people? I mean, Push in a little bit more. I hope you're pushing back in your own mind. That's a good thing. Let's engage with this. Do your political views draw you towards people or do they put up walls? If we're not careful, we can assume things about people that believe something different than us and therefore we categorize them and we step back from them because they believe something different than we do. Does your worldview draw you towards people 
or pull you back away from them. I talk about worldview a lot and living from a biblical worldview. Scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. The world that we live in says love yourself at the expense of your neighbor. Do you see the difference? Do you see if we live life from a cultural worldview, we're going to put self at the center. And we do this really well. We have the ability to twist and to change the narrative of the circumstances of our life and we get at the center of the injustice that's going on in our world. We have a way of manipulating thoughts and conversations so that we become the victim. And when that happens, we're at the center of our world view. And when we're at the center, then we push back against others, we're offended by others, walls go up between us and others, and our beliefs and our convictions drive us away from people instead of drawing us towards them in order to love them. If God is at the center if Jesus is at the center, if we understand accurately who we are because he is at the center, we say, I know that I am loved by God, not because of what I do, but because of what he's done for me. Therefore, that love then overflows into the lives of other people. And because I'm secure in who I am with him, I don't have to find my self-worth in the relationships with other people. And I know there's pushback and we can talk about that and, you know, what happens when somebody's enabling and what happens when, you know, I'm taking advantage of. And yeah, that's worth having that conversation. I'm just trying to help us flesh out this concept of Jesus saying, people will know that you're a follower of mine. People will know that you're a disciple of mine in the way that you love other people. So here's my question for you. Who's that going to be for you? Because it's easy for me to preach a message like this and say, okay, just go and do it. Love everybody. Make every, counter, make every encounter a grace encounter. And we should live that way. People that we encounter all the time should live with that mentality. But I want you to zero in on this. Is there one person, maybe it's your spouse, Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker. Who is the person in your life that is so difficult for you to love? And what would it look like, turning the page to 2018, to say, I know it's going to be hard. I know I might get hurt as a result. But I'm going to be intentional about loving this person as we go forward. And then the question becomes, when you figure out the who, then the question is, how do I do that? How does that become a reality? And I think we could press in and I could give you lots of Bible verses to tell you how to do that. But I think inherently we know. Do you know why we know? Because we know that love is acting in another person's best interest. Thinking of others is more important than ourselves. Putting God and others at the center and not ourselves. So when you figure out the who, I think the how becomes somewhat obvious. Acting in another person's best interest. So who is the who? And then what does that look like for you to do that as we go into 2018? We've got to get this right. Our beliefs, our convictions, our, is our theology, are those things important? Absolutely. But we have to get this right. Wouldn't it be awesome if the world would look at Christians, if the world would look at the church, if the world would look at Calvary Church and say, I don't always understand what they believe. 
And sometimes when they gather together, they seem to do some kooky things, and I don't always understand what's going on there. However, I'm so jealous of the way that they love one another. And there's something about the way that they love people that are nothing like them that is so attractive. So here's how I'm going to launch you into 2018. I'm going to launch you into 2018 with a Christmas song. But I'm going to do it, and hopefully it's going to change the way you think about this song from now going forward. And here's my desire. I don't know if this is possible or not. But my hope is that this song will be the last Christmas song that you hear and the last Christmas song that you sing this Christmas and holiday season. So if there are still radio stations that are playing Christmas music, don't listen to them. (laughs) This is going to be the last one. And it's a familiar song, but have you ever stopped long enough to understand the words? The first verse of O Holy Night tells us about the event of Jesus' first coming. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. The world is in sin and error, and when he comes, there's rejoicing. And there's a sense of worth that comes and hope that comes because the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of Man, has been born. So the first verse tells us about the event that took place and that we celebrate all month long and really should be all year long. And then we jump to verse 3. And do you know what verse 3 is? Verse 3 tells us how we are to now live in light of his first coming and looking forward to his second coming. Truly, he taught us to love one another. He didn't just do it with his words, but he showed us how to do it self-sacrificially. His law summed up, love God, love others. All the law, the prophets and Moses summed up by saying love God and love others. His law is love And his gospel, his good news is peace. Peace between God and man. Why? Because he's the repairman who doesn't need our help. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother. That person that we've put up walls because they look different or they think different or they believe different than us. The coming of Christ should break those chains. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. And we see examples of that happening all over the planet today. But it won't happen in totality until his return. And as a result of how we are living and what he's done, how should we respond? We should respond with praise and thanksgiving. This verse of this very familiar Christmas song tells us the story of his coming and it tells us how we should live in light of his return. Why Jesus? Because he did what nobody else can do. And then he equips and empowers us to live a life of love that can change this hurt and dying and broken world. Let's pray as we prepare to sing this together. Father God in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Sending him to do what we try to do, but we can't do. You sent him to do what only he can do, to be our savior, our rescuer, our deliverer, our Messiah, our repairman. Thank you for that truth. And as a result, may we live a life marked by love. Not love that we're trying to drum up on our own. Not love that's contractual, you do this for me, I'll do this for you. But love that comes from the self 
sacrificial life and example of Jesus. So may we live that way. May we live anticipating his return and be ready for it at any moment. And as a result, may that gospel of peace be spread to a hurt and dying and broken world. And would you do that for your honor and glory? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing this together. we can help, if we can serve you in any way, please let us know. I want to remind you of the welcome gathering out the doors to the right. Love to connect with you there. Have a very, very happy and safe new year and no more Christmas music. (laughs) We'll see you next week and see you next year. God bless you all.